Okay. Now, I hope that uh, you understand that precaution. I don't want to make you nervous. We're not going to talk about the mechanics of sex in this class. Uh, what we're going to do, though, is talk about the subject. I think it's very important to do because, I mean, where are you going to go and have a, a discussion like this? I think a marriage seminar is the place to do it. And, and frankly, to uh, choose to not live stream it gives me the freedom that I want to, to, to say some rather frank things that I think need to be said, but I won't have to worry about some people watching that don't need to be watching that are too young or whatever. But I'm glad that you're here. Let's talk about the intimacy of marriage. It's very interesting to me that in the scriptures, sex in marriage is a given. It's not merely a, a blessing or just a prerogative or a choice that you can make. It's actually something which is called natural. In Romans chapter 1, I think about verse 11 and following, you have this discussion of homosexuality. And, and part of the reasoning that Paul uses to call that vile affection, the practice of homosexuality is an abomination against God. Despite what our, our distorted culture is saying, the Bible's always going to read the same. That's not a matter of opinion. I mean, uh, what I think about it is not really relevant. What I can say for an objective fact is that the Bible teaches that the practice is sinful. But in that discussion in Romans 1, here's how he describes it. He says, And the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. The natural use of the woman. Isn't that interesting? In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, then, the beginning of the chapter, to avoid fornication... Now remember we talked about the definition of that last night. Fornication means sinful sex. So a lot of things are under the umbrella of the word fornication. Uh, two, two unmarried people engage in intercourse, and that's fornication. Two men or two women ever, ever engage in, in sexual practices, and that is fornication. If a man has a, he's a married man, and he is intimate with another woman, that's fornication, and it's also, it would also be called adultery. To avoid fornication, Paul says, in the beginning of this discussion about sexuality, he says, let every man have his own wife, let every woman have her own husband. The Bible just assumes that marriage is going to be a sexual relationship. And that's a wonderful thing. I, I would say to you that, I mean, well, how would you answer this question? Um, what is the purpose for which God made sex. I mean, it is God did it. God created two genders. I doubt had we been in the, in the creative process that we would have ever thought this up. But he did. Now, what is the purpose of intimacy in marriage? What is the purpose? And if you answer, well, procreation. Well, I, well, I would say that's number two, and it's not really a close second. I understand procreation. I got that. But the purpose of intimacy in marriage is to draw husbands and wives closer together. That is the primary purpose. I would argue my case by saying that, that after the childbearing years, there's a, a, a period of time, depending on the couple, perhaps an extended period of time, in, in which they still enjoy intimacy, and they will enjoy some kind of sexual intimacy until they die. So, did you ever have an argument? We talked about fighting fair last session. It's kind of a remarkable thing, among other things, is that, that it, it may not feel like you've really fixed that division between you until you're intimate again, and somehow things seem to be set right again. In this session, what I want to do is to give you five things about intimacy that you cannot do anything about, things you cannot change. And then we're going to start a second list of five things which you can change in reference to this important subject. All right, let's put it up. Number one, you cannot change the fact that all marriages sometimes have a frequency imbalance. And typically, the man's need for frequency is, of course, greater than his wife's. Now, it's not always true. I read a study recently that said that it's true in 85% of marriages. Now, you may be in that other 15%, and, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. God bless you and all, and I hope you have a wonderful marriage. But typically speaking, in most marriages, 
large percentage, the man's need for frequency is greater than his wife's. What is the right frequency? I said yesterday that I think that, that, that our intimacy in our marriages is often a barometer. Not, this is not a strict scientific thing, but it's often a barometer for how the rest of the marriage is going. If the sex is really good, then probably the marriage is good in reference to the happiness gauge. What's, what's the biblical frequency that's appropriate? It's kind of funny about, about Christian men. Christian men don't, don't sit around. I don't know what women do. I've never been one. But Christian men don't sit around and talk about frequency. We, Christian men are more discreet and should be discreet about such matters. This is too personal. and It should just be between us. It's between a husband and his wife. We don't just sit around and chat. How many times a week for you? How many times a month for you? We, we would rarely have such a conversation. And, and a wife, especially a young one, I think may, may look at her husband and say, you want this again? Didn't we just do that? Because she just can't imagine that his need for frequency is as great as it is. What is the, what is the rule in the Bible? And the answer is 1 Corinthians 7 again. And it is that, that your body doesn't belong to you anymore. When you marry, it belongs to your spouse that you give your sexuality over to the degree that Paul says, don't defraud one the other. You know what defraud means? We, we had a, I went to court one day, I wasn't the defendant, but somebody several years ago had broken into our church building in the night, some, some drug, druggy people, addicted, and so they wanted anything they could get. There's not much you can steal inside of a church building. I don't know what they thought they would find. But they took a couple of microphones, and I think they took a coffee maker. And so here we were. I was called to court to testify. And what I was to do is to answer this question, do you have the authority to admit somebody to your church building in the middle of the night? Yes, sir, I do. Did you grant the, the defendants that authority, that permission to come in? No, sir, I didn't. That's how much they needed me for. But I went a little early, and I heard a couple of cases, and, and the judge was, was judging a case of a shoplifter. And, and in that, he, he threw the book at him. He said, and this was in Virginia, and he said, why do you come to Roanoke to defraud these merchants? Why don't you go back to Blacksburg, where you came from, and, and steal from those people instead? He, didn't, he was facetious, but, but the point is that he used the word defraud. And, and I love to study the Bible, and so, wow, right off, I thought, defraud, defraud. 1 Corinthians 7 uses that word, and it's about sex and marriage. Don't defraud one the other. You know what defraud means? To take something that doesn't belong to you. Your, your body doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to your spouse. What's the frequency? And the answer is that marriage, and I understand that there are some circumstances that are plainly distorted, and where, where there are problems in that marriage about sex that, that need help, that you need to work on and get some outside help and all of that. But in a normal, typical kind of marriage, the answer is that, that sex is designed for the satisfaction of both. And the frequency is, is to take care of both persons' needs. Now here's number two, and it's similar to that. Sex is not an option in his mind. Because it's a biological need in a man, it's not so different from eating and drinking. I understand that if you don't eat, you die. And you, you don't die if you don't have sex, but life is considerably changed. Think about this. In the scriptures, you have what I would argue is a... Is a mm, 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 it demonstrates this point that a man is different from a woman about his physical, biological, and frequent need about intimacy. Walk, walk with me along this line. You get to Genesis chapter 30, and Jacob has Rachel and Leah. He's polygamous. Didn't mean to be. It was sort of thrust upon him, I guess. But <clears throat> polygamy never turned out good. Never did. Always turned out bad. Some people practice it today. And, and they get on TV, and they say, wow, I got four wives. I got five wives. We're just as happy as we can be. Well, that's a lie. I don't know uh, if you fall for that, but that's not true. We weren't designed for polygamy. Anyway, he has two wives. And Rachel and Leah are out in the field one day, and one of their sons, one of Leah's sons, comes and he's found some mandrakes. It's a root, and they believed that it would promote fertility. I don't know what you would do with the root. I don't know if you would boil it and, and make tea and drink it, or you would put them on the mattress. I don't know what you would do with the mandrakes. But anyway, they, that's what they thought. And so these two sisters, who were in a race to have more babies, who can have more babies? 
Uh, and of course, Leah is very profligate about that, and, and Rachel can't have children very good. So there's the discussion. And they negotiate who's going to sleep with the husband that night. I guess, I guess these discussions always happen in polygamous marriages, and I'm telling you, it's not going to work out. It won't work out. Anyway, they have this discussion, negotiate who is going to get to sleep with the husband. But the thing is, that the implication is that whoever sleeps with him is going to be intimate with him that night, which is interesting to me. Enough that they just know, they know that's what's going to happen. He will want to be intimate with whomever he happens to be sleeping that night. When you see scriptures where you have sexual offense committed in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it's always that the man's the aggressor, David and Bathsheba, uh, Judah and Tamar, Amnon and the other Tamar. When you go to the book of Proverbs, you have a baker's dozen, I think about 13 occurrences, where you have warnings about sexuality. In every case, it's a warning to the men to control their sexual urges and to stay away from prostitutes. You control yourself. When you get to the New Testament, you have warnings about immodest apparel. Don't you think it's interesting that it's always gender-specific? Always is. Matthew 5 and 28, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Don't you think it's wrong for a man to, or a woman to lust after a man? I would argue that it would be equally wrong. Well, that's not my point. The point is that the warning is, is designed for the lion's share of the problem. It would be a man looking at a woman. We got that figured out, don't we? When you get to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and you talk about the specific about modest apparel, it's about let a woman dress in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Why is that? Well, it's because of this. You can't change the fact that sex is not optional in his mind. It's a biological thing. And, and of course, I know that I'm talking to, to married people, and I know that you know this. I just want to keep building this, this house as we go through this discussion. Sex is, in his mind, um, so very important. And what it does is to right the ship. And there will be times when he's under a lot of stress. I mean, the transmission in the van's gone out, and it's going to cost $4,000. What are we going to do about that? How am I going to get that $4,000? And the toilet upstairs has overflowed. And look at the mess. I've got to clean up this mess. And my boss is breathing down my neck. And what am I going to do? I need to be making more money than I'm making, but I don't see how I can ask him for the raise. And then he can get with his wife. And if they have a pleasant fulfilling time together in the context of what we're talking about. He's going to lay there in the bed. and He's going to say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to ask him for a raise tomorrow. You know. he, suddenly he knows what he's, and suddenly his, his, the ship is righted. His, his world gets righted again. I don't mean that it's miraculous. I just mean, and you know this is true. He, he gets his psyche back again. It puts things right. It's very much... I don't mean to be in any way crude. I want to use the right kind of language throughout this whole session, but it's very much like putting your phone on the charger. And, and over time, you know that it goes down, and, and you can plug that thing in again, and it charges back up. He needs to be charged up in that way, and that's a biological process. Why do you think God did that? Doesn't that seem very strange to you? Oh, I don't think it's strange at all. I, I, don't, I don't think so. What it is is that in a normal healthy marriage, the man cannot be apart from his wife very long without the volume getting too loud in his ears about sex. So that's a good thing. So maybe you have a fuss. Maybe you get feelings hurt. Maybe, maybe you really had an, an argument. And so he, he goes, well, he's just going to stay away from you. He'll sleep on the couch. How long can he keep that up? Before, before his need for intimacy is going to humble him and he's going to come back in there and he wants to fix I, I would say to you that, that removing the sexual relationship would spell disaster for most marriages. I'm not elevating sex as being number one on, on the important things of marriage. It's just one of the top ones. But it has a key role and God meant for it to be like this. You, uh, 
your house. Sometimes supper's late. It's like I was saying yesterday, you, you, your supper's late, and what does your husband do? You see him, he goes over to the pantry, and he just kind of stands there. Right? Maybe to the fridge, and he just stands there in the fridge, looking at the fridge. What is he? He's looking for something. He's hungry. He's looking for something to eat. A similar thing happens to a man after he hasn't been intimate for a while. And while this is no excuse, it becomes increasingly difficult for him to keep his eyes off of other women. He doesn't want it to be that way. And I'm not excusing the looking at pornography or looking at other women. I'm not excusing any of that because the Scripture won't excuse that. I'm just saying that it becomes a greater challenge for him the longer he's away from his phone charger, if you please. Number three. You can't change the fact that sin poisons great sex. You will not change that. You cannot change that. A man who is using pornography, is looking at other women in this way, is damaging his marriage. And, and what you cannot change is that the wife, uh, when being intimate with her husband, will unavoidably think, He's comparing me to those other women. I don't compare to those other women. I'll never be able to match up because they're not real anyway. You've got ways that those pictures, those images are enhanced. I can never compare with that, but I know that's what he's thinking about. He's not thinking about me. He's thinking about those other women. fact of the matter is, if he's been swimming in the waters of pornography, it's probably true. And so, do you think that I'm opposed to pornography? Buddy, I am. I just see too much of what it does to people's lives. Sin will poison great sex. Incidentally, um, pornography can be overcome. I mean the habit of pornography. I'm here to tell you that I've been doing this accountability system for about 20 years, and you can, if you really want to overcome it, you can do it. With You probably won't be able to do it by yourself, but you can do it with help. And I can explain how, and I'll be happy to talk with you about that. And you can call me later or write to me or anything I can do to help about that. Sin of poison great sex. Uh, sometimes I'm asked questions about self-gratification. And what about that? The answer is that the New Testament does not prohibit that act. What it does say is that, that lust is a sin. And very often, in the practice of that activity, uh, mental images would be exacerbated. And so that would be wrong. Further, uh, you know, you could, you could create habits which are very difficult to break and would be damaging to the marriage, and that would be a concern. But after a person is married, when a person is married, I would say 1 Corinthians 7 would prohibit that action. And, and I would say that because Paul goes to great lengths to say your body doesn't belong to you anymore. It's not yours anymore. It belongs to your spouse. Which I, I would have to argue would certainly make that practice a sinful one. Adultery is the kind of sin that will mess up sex. I believe that a couple, I know it's true, after adultery has been committed, and you put the marriage back together again, which is what I encourage. If your spouse ever commits adultery, and I, I'm a visitor here, I don't know you, but if that ever happens, I, I do not want you to think that the first thing you do is to get a divorce. I know what Matthew 19.9 says. I know that that's something which you're permitted to do, but I don't think it's a good idea. What, what the first thing you need to find out is, is my partner, my guilty spouse, penitent? Is he penitent or her? Penitent. And if the answer is yes, a, a terrible thing has happened in your marriage, a nuclear bomb. Adultery is a nuclear bomb that goes off in a marriage. Terrible thing, but you could put that thing back together again. What I tell couples to do, I tell the offended spouse, if you please, that we're going to drop a contract at the top of the paper. It's not a legal document, it's a moral document, but at the top of the paper it says... I will take you back and I will make a go of this marriage under these conditions. Now, what would you put on that list? Your spouse has committed adultery. He's, he's so penitent. He, want, he wants forgiveness, promises 
I, I'm so sorry. What would you put on the list? I will, I will make a go of this under these conditions. The first one is, of course, and I'll just make this brief, but the first one's going to be utter separation from this person. And, and I want evidence. And, and it might be good that when, when you... I have a lot of stupid husbands. I don't mean that. I have a f some foolish husbands who say... Or wives. Oh, I've heard wives say it. She's committed adultery, and she regrets it, and she wants to put her marriage back together again, and her husband's willing, but she says something like this to her husband. But you know that I have loved him, that other man, and so I really want to go personally and alone to talk to him about this. You know what the answer is to that? No. Of course not. No, 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 no. Again, if Proverbs chapter 5 says, don't go near to the door of her house. You've got to stay away from that. And it's got to be clean and quick, and you've got to look at it in the eyes, from the eyes perspective of the offended spouse. What is he thinking? He doesn't want to think about you going over there privately and talking to that person again. That would be on the list. Another thing on the list is that we're, we're going to be faithful to the Lord and to the worship assemblies. We're going to have, another would be we're going to have counseling from a Christian, a New Testament Christian, who will give us good counsel. Uh, another, you, you can imagine, another would be that I have access, and everybody, all, this ought to be true about all of us, that, that I will have all of your passwords and access to all of your devices, all of them, that there will be no place in your life. I'll have access to your wallet. I'll have access to your purse. There will be nothing in your world that's off bounds to me. And I want you to know that I'm going to check those things. Until we build this back, I'm going to check those things. I won't tell you when, but you're giving me carte blanche to look at anything in your world. Furthermore, I, I have your permission. If, if I think there's stuff on your computer that you're lying to me about, I have your permission to pick up your laptop and take it to somebody who can look through it, who's smarter than me about computers. Total transparency. Total accountability. And, and this kind of list, and by the way, if the guilty spouse, and I'm going farther than I mean to about this, but if the guilty spouse bucks about any of those points, He's probably still doing it. He probably is still doing it. A man who's penitent or a woman who's penitent who says, I really want to put the marriage back and I've, I've sinned, I've just done so wrong, is so grateful, is so grateful when that offended husband or, or wife is willing to make a go of this. Of course I'll do right. Of course I will do. Of course you can have access. Of course whatever I can do to make this right, I will do. All right, but back to the point. You can't change the fact that sin poisons great sex. Number four. You can't change the fact that a typical husband never gets tired of seeing his wife unclothed. This is, uh, isn't this interesting that I want you uh, Stand back a minute from the, I don't know, the erotica of that point, if you, if you please, and just think about the fact that your husband didn't wake up one day. When he was 13 years old or whatever, he didn't wake up one day and say, I, I think what I will do is be very attracted to the female form. He never decided that. It, it was decided for him. And don't you think it's interesting that... I'm just, what I'm doing is illustrating the fact that this is a God thing. This is a creation thing. That, that a woman's ankle or elbow is flesh and bones. It's part of her body, and her breast is part of her body. And yet one of them is to the husband no big deal. The other is a big deal. Why is that true? The other one fills him with desire. Can you explain that? Logically, I would say that it's not explainable. It doesn't. What's the difference? Flesh and bone and blood and tissue. But there's a huge difference, and I'm telling you, anybody who, who denies that just doesn't have his head screwed on right. It's just obvious, and everybody knows it. We have laws in a country that is so very liberal that it's in trouble right now, but we still have laws about things that have to be covered up. And, and I would tell you that those laws acknowledge the point I'm making. What I'm saying to you is that I think that particularly a young wife may realize how much her husband likes to look at her in this way. 
And she may, she may even say to him, I just think you're oversexed. You, you want it all the time, and you want to look at me all the time, and I just think that you're... And you know what? The truth is, I don't think he knows the answer to that. How would he know? How would he know if he's got some, some problem? I'm just saying that, that I, I doubt he does. Sometimes a man gets in trouble, but the fact that he really enjoys looking at you is not a wrong thing. It's not a bad thing. The fact of the matter is, you really want your husband to turn his eyes away from those, those sexy billboards, from certainly from pornography, from, other, from women that get, the weather gets hot and they walk around with hardly any clothes on. and You want him to practice bouncing his eyes. That's what Christian men practice doing. We, we look at such a thing and it registers in our minds and, and our, our practice is to bounce away from that. Get, it, get our eyes on something else. And that's what you want your husband to do. I only have eyes for you for my wife, only for her. But I want you to know that that he wants to see you. You are the most beautiful, amazing creature that he's ever known. And he will never get enough of that. He never will. So when you're in the house and you, I mean, you're different from him, you are. A woman doesn't look at a man's body the same way. What, what a woman, the, the physical attraction she has when, he, when she looks at her husband's body, and I understand there's an attraction there, but it's, it's little league by comparison. It is not comparable. Oh, you know, if, if, he's, if y'all are getting ready in the morning and the wife steps out of the shower and he happens to be standing there, his whole world goes gray and his eyes just focus on her and he just stands there with his mouth agape. Right? And she says, quit, quit looking, quit looking. If she happens to be standing there and he gets out of the shower and she sees him and she'll say, you're, stand on the mat, you're getting water all over the floor. <laughs> right? Because I'm telling you, it's not the same thing. And, and so these are things you can't do anything about. You can't change that, but why should you? And so when your husband... You know, you, you catch, you, you're in your room and you have your robe on or whatever and, and you're bending over or it's coming open and you look over, happen to look in the mirror and you see his reflection and he's staring at you. Don't rebuke him. Don't, don't make him feel like he's some sort of sexual deviant. Don't say, quit looking at me. You make me self-conscious. Don't do that. Don't look at me. Stop that. You, if, if he's enjoying looking at you, you should linger a little longer and let him enjoy looking at you. You want him to have eyes for you only. Well, let him enjoy looking at you. You're the most beautiful creature he knows. Here's number five. You can't do anything about that all wives carry a sarg. Now, that's a manufactured word. It's an acronym, and it means sex sex affection ratio gauge. What I mean by that is that I think every wife has this gauge inside of her psyche that measures... Uh, what we talked about last night about how to, to communicate affection to your wife, the kinds of things that she finds affectionate, that she really, really appreciates and loves. She, she's going to gauge that against how interested you are about sex with her. And there may be times that, that she will say to you, I think you only love me for one thing. Okay. Well, that's not really true. It's not really true, but what you need to do is to be sure, gentlemen, that you adequately express that. So go back and listen to that lecture a couple of more times, keep notes, and and then implement it in your life. When you're walking down the street with her, don't miss an opportunity to walk holding her hand. When you're in the car or van together and, and you're driving along and she's sitting beside you, if you can reach her hand, do it and hold her hand. If you take a walk together, don't pass up a big oak tree, a great opportunity to go behind that tree and kiss her good. When you give her flowers, did you hear me say this yesterday? It's great to give her flowers anytime, assuming that she likes flowers, and most women do. You, you, you'll get points. You, you'll get points if you give her flowers on days that you're anticipating sex. But on those days when you're not, and you're, you don't have an ulterior sexual motive, That's the best time to give her flowers. Do you hear what I'm saying? The best time to give your wife flowers is when it has nothing to do with sex in your mind. Nothing. Because she has a sarg. All right, five things that you 
can do something about. You can do something about who initiates the intimacy. Now, in most marriages, the greatest frequency is the husband initiating intimacy, uh, intimacy because of the reasons that we've been talking about. And you know, I don't, think, I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that's a wrong thing. I just want to put something in the mind of the wives. And that is that, that your husband, your husband dreads the feeling, if he ever has it, that you put up with him sexually, that that's your attitude toward him sexually. You just put up with him. In his mind, respect for him, admiration for him, is, is a direct connection to sex. Sex is directly connected to respect. It, it is. And how much you esteem him is directly connected. Now, I don't know that I could even explain that. I'm just, I'm just asserting it that it's true. And sometimes what you do is initiated. When you do, you're going to communicate something awesome to him. Awesome. Big, big, big. Because you're saying, I, uh, this is something I want with you. I want to be with you this way. It's going to send his brain in a great place. I don't think, it's, I don't think you have to try to be the, the one always who initiates. But once in a while, it's a, that's a nice thing. So, you, you know, maybe you're going over to somebody's house for supper, another couple, and, and as he's easing over to ring the bell, in the process of ringing the bell, you just ease up and whisper in his ear, when I get you home, this is what, this is what we're going to do. Bing bong. And All through the evening, during the meal, how time passes, he will say. We're, we're going to need to be going. Or maybe you could just slip a note into his briefcase or his lunchbox or whatever he carries. Be very discreet, of course, so that nobody else sees it. But suppose you write him a note and, and, and it says, when you get home at this time, this is what I've got planned for you, big boy. You know, this is, this is it. And I'm telling you, listen to this old preacher. He will not get any work done that day because he's thinking about you. All he can think about is you. Is that a bad thing? No, I think that's a terrific thing. And it's, it's one of the secrets about a really joyful marriage. Did I tell you at the beginning, good marriage is hard work. Good marriage for the best marriage is hard work. And you get up every morning and you say, how can I make it good today? How can I make it good? I mean, in the best marriages, how can I make it good today? You, can't, you can change who initiates. All right, here's number two can change the routine of utter predictability. Now, it's not uncommon for, for a wife to think, uh, in reference to intimacy, I, I just, I just want to do what's comfortable and what works well. And that's it. In his mind, he may think, you know, I like what works well too, and sometimes it might be nice to go other places or to, to do this in other places, maybe a little adventure. And the wife says, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe one day you'll be on a beautiful day and you'll be taking a hike somewhere in, in a wooded place and he starts to get a little, you know, and you say, no, not here. But I don't know. Maybe, maybe you could find a place privately out there somewhere. And you say, my wife may feel a little self-conscious about that. I can understand that, but I can tell you what's going to happen. One of these days you'll be sitting there beside his deathbed and as he's drawing his last breaths, he's going to say to you, remember the hike? Because he'll remember that. He'll remember it. What you could do is um, the, the routine of utter predictability, and sometimes that can happen. And you, you could go to the bookstore and buy a, a tastefully written book. Be careful about that. I don't think that, that you need to go together to buy this book. The wife needs to buy this book. Maybe you could order it on Amazon. Because a lot of that stuff is pornographic, and I don't want you to get any of that. But sometimes the thing is, is tastefully written. Like, these two are pretty good. Sheet Music by Kevin Lehman. The Gift of Sex by Clifford and Joyce Penner. Uh, you can look those up, and that would be helpful. But wouldn't it be fun to read a book like that together? And perhaps there will be ideas that both of you would find acceptable. I want to say something plainly to you at this point, and that is this. Gentlemen, do not do things sexually that are painful or harmful, hurtful 
to your wife, either physically or spiritually. The golden rule says you treat people like you want to be treated. And when I talk about this and about veering from utter predictability, I do not mean that it's okay to do things that hurt her. Do not hurt her. Number next. You can, you can change how well you communicate to your wife that she's all you need. A very foolish man uses pornography. A very foolish man seeks out other forms of, of that kind of activity to look at. A very foolish man will go to a restaurant with his wife and when a pretty little thing with some skimpy shorts walks by, here's what he does. Or they're in the mall and they pass Victoria's Secret and as they walk together, he does this. Right? And you think that your wife doesn't have eyes in the back of her head? You think she doesn't see that? You think that doesn't have an effect? Can you hear me? An effect in her psyche about how she views you sexually? Let me tell you a very important lesson about this. Sex has to be exclusive. There must be a, an utter exclusivity attached to it for it to be right and good. I would argue that God saved his very best for us in marriage in reference to this subject. The world's gone crazy. I mean, because it, because it doesn't admit any boundaries. There should be no boundaries. Free. It, it all came out of, out of the 1960s and the hippie movement. And they, they, they touted free love and they got all crazy, and then they had children, and then those children had children, and now we have this generation. And you know what pansexual means? Pansexual means I want sex anytime I want it with whomever I want it, and I don't care what gender or age or anything, just whoever I'm close to and I desire them. That's the only thing that matters. And hell shoots fireworks about that. But none of that, it doesn't turn out good. You, you see one of, these, one of these men that's turned himself into a woman? It's a masquerade, you know. There's nothing about that that's real. It's all pretend. It's, it's, it's the emperor's new clothes. Remember that story from when you were a kid? And people, foolish, foolish, foolish people, start calling him by female pronouns. Don't you ever do that. Because you're, because you're, because you care about him. That's why you shouldn't do it. It's a Halloween costume, a very expensive one, and sometimes which involves surgery. But it's all a lie. And furthermore, it's not good for him. One of these days, he's going to wake up and regret that terrible thing he's done. It's awful. And and if you care and love him, care about him, and you should care about her, and you should, then don't be a party to that. Back to the point. You communicate to your wife that she's all you need by showing her in your actions that you only have eyes for her. She will know if you're practicing that policy. She will know. She sees those little women walk by with those short shorts on or those little skirts or those low-cut blouses. She watches those. She knows they're there. And then she's watching your eyes. And she'll be able to tell. And after a, a thousand times that she sees that you look away, she will know. And when she goes to bed with you, she will, she will accept the fact that you only have eyes for her. You could say it to her too. Say it to her. You're everything that I need. Everything that I need and want. Now four. How do you say no? Is it possible? And we've had a session this morning about how to love a husband about how to respect him and teach him, show him respect, and how you, how you, uh, well, you, you uh, how you obey him, and all the things the Bible says about that. And so you apply that to the intimacy of marriage. How does that play out? And is it, in view of 1 Corinthians seven, saying our bodies don't belong to us anymore? Is it even possible scripturally for a wife to say no to her husband, and and not sin or not bruise his ego? Can that happen? Yes. Yes, it can. I'm going to tell you the secret. I mean, you know, there are various reasons. Maybe you've got little children, and, and he comes home at the end of the day, and you look at his eyes, and you think, I know what you've got in mind. But, you, you know, you haven't had a shower today, and there's, there's stuff that's been spit, on, spit up on your shirt, and you don't even know what it is. 
right? And you just, all your femininity is just completely drained out of you and you're tired. Or maybe it has to do with cycles, your cycle, and, or maybe it has to do with a, or a, hair, a headache, or maybe it has to do with, you know, it's his off day and you're going to go into town and do some things. And so in the morning you've, you've, uh, you've bathed and, you, and you've done your hair and you're finishing that last little thing on your makeup and the mirror in your bathroom and you turn and there he's standing there and you look at his eyes and you think, oh me, I know what you're thinking. So on these occasions, how do you say, because it's terribly inconvenient or not very comfortable, how do you say no without doing wrong and without hurting his, his ego and, and it makes the, the tone of the house unpleasant? How do you do that? And the answer is this. You look at him and you say, baby, I, I can tell what you have in mind. I want to be with you too. Now's not a really good time for me because of this or that. But if you'll wait until 10 o'clock tonight, I'll make it worth your while. That's it. You know what he's going to do? Standing there in your bathroom door with that silly look on his face, you know what he's going to do when you say that? He's going to say, that's what he's going to do. Now, now listen, if you say 10 o'clock, don't make it 10.01 that night because he's looking at 10 o'clock. He can't wait. All day long he's going to think about you. He can't wait to be with you that night. And, and you haven't heard him, and you haven't done a wrong thing. Pick the time. Don't say, I want to be with you too, and how about 2022? You know, you know, don't do that. <laughs> but, I, but you understand you understand the message. Here's the last one on our list. Things that you can change. How you prepare for sex. You can change. I talked to you about the women rules. And one of the women rules is that I don't discuss detailed sexual problems with women. So uh, if the subject is raised, that's okay with me in counseling, if I'm counseling a woman alone. But if it starts to get into the details, I just stop her and say, you know, I, I really think it would be more appropriate for you to talk to Mrs. Colley about that. She'll be happy to discuss all of these things with you. I've never had a woman that, that didn't readily agree to what I asked at that point, never did. And one day I was speaking at a, a thing in a, I don't know, a arena coliseum kind of place and had different sessions going on at the same time. And I finished and then I went out and there was a big corridor with some benches, a lot of people around. And a woman approached me, she'd been in the lecture and she said, can we talk a couple of minutes? Of course, of course, sat down. And she said, here's my problem in my marriage is that she said, it's about, it's about sex. And she said, my husband won't brush his teeth. And his teeth are rotting. And my heart broke for this woman. I, I, I rather didn't know what to say. I, what I needed is to have him in front of me instead of her right? Because I would know what to say to him. And, and I, so I said what I could to try to encourage her to, to give contact so that maybe if he was interested in talking to somebody confidentially, we could do that. I would be happy to do that. That's an egregious example. But here's what I want to say to you. Gentlemen, ready? Brush your teeth. Use a good, strong mouthwash. Should you wear cologne or not? Easy, that's easy. Look at your wife and say, would you like me to wear cologne or not? Whatever the woman says, do that. Should you wear facial hair or not? Some of you uh, ugly men have facial hair. I'm just teasing, I like your beards. That's an easy one too. What I would say is, you get with, with your woman and you say, Honey, do you like me better with facial hair or without it? I, I cannot imagine her saying, I don't, I don't prefer it. I don't like how it feels. And then you say, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Well, okay, great, great for you. Okay, see how that works out. Very good. <laughs> uh, it, but ask her her preference. Uh, she may just love that beard, and that's a fine thing. Take a shower. 
Be conscious of your hygiene. I know that this may seem self-evident, intuitive. I got that, but I'm not sure that all the, all the men get this. And so we're better than a marriage seminar to hear it. Practice good hygiene. Now, women, listen, I, I, I want to be very delicate about this, but the fact is that it may be that in a woman's mind, she thinks as long as he gets satisfaction, the hygiene thing doesn't matter to him. And you know what? There's a degree to which that's true. I mean, I understand the, the sense in which that may be, but it's not wholly true. And I can tell you right now that he will really, really feel complimented if you're concerned about hygiene. He will feel like you respect him because you went to some effort to be prepared and to be presentable to him in reference to this part of your marriage. If I'd been the creator of human, the human race, I can't imagine that I would have ever thought of two genders and sexuality. I, I, don't, I don't see that I would have ever thought of that. But I can tell you that your God in heaven is the uh, personification of wisdom and an ultimate unlimited creativity. And what he did was brilliant about sex. It is so dangerous in the ways that we've talked about. It is, it is, it is a nuclear bomb when it's misused. It destroys people and lives. It destroys kids. I don't know how you, how you over-express that. But when it's, when it's governed and, and it has the proper walls built around it, it is such an advantage to a wonderful marriage, such a happy part of our lives and our marriages. It is an enhancement that helps us get through life and creates this atmosphere between us, the freedom level of communication. You know, you know what I'm talking about? That freedom level. It helps us to have that. I, you, you say things to your husband or wife that you can't say to anybody else. And that's what God intended. If you don't have it, if you don't have it, I would urge you to do the things necessary to find it. Thank you for coming to the, the seminar. And I hope there are some things that you can take home with you. It is my prayer and my wish that all of you will not just have a mediocre marriage or a miserable marriage, but that you will all have music in your marriage and that God will bless you. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for loving us. And thank you for creating two genders, and thank you for creating marriage, and thank you for creating intimacy. And help us to appreciate the profundity of it, and help us to appreciate that the joy of it really only comes when we operate within your boundaries. Help us, Father, to be the best husbands and wives that we can be, Help us to find the joy, the happiness, and the music in marriage. And forgive us, O oh Lord, of our sins. Give us wisdom and courage. In Jesus' name, amen. To, to utilizing those uh, in my own marriage. And so I, I really appreciate that very much. Thank you for coming this way and, um, and doing this for us. Glenn has left some um, books and CDs out on the table here. And there's a little blue box there so you can drop your check or cash in if you would like any of those. If they don't have, or if they're watching this back and they don't have any type payment today, is there a place they can go to get that stuff? Yes, colleyhouse.org. Colleyhouse.org, C-O-L-L. E-Y. Okay. 
thecollyhouse.org, no spaces. So if you'd like to, if you don't have the ability to get it today or if you're watching online, you can uh, go to thecollyhouse.org and uh, purchase that material. And I know I've got, and a lot of other things, yes, yes. And uh, I've got a couple of Glenn's books and have read them and uh, does, does a wonderful job. And so really appreciate, really appreciate the work that he does. Um, Last thing we want to say is, uh, you know, the elders, the elders talked a long time and, and uh, worked a long time to get Glenn here for this. Whether you're watching online or here, we know it's uh, unusual circumstances. We didn't expect this to happen when he came with the COVID stuff and all that. But what they have committed to is wanting to let you know if there's anybody who's struggling in their marriage, in their relationships, if there's individuals who are engaged and want to go through the process of premarital counseling or whatever the case may be, uh, reach out to us and we'll get you in contact with people who we trust and know who are able and capable and qualified to help in those areas who would side right along with everything that Glenn has said and to help you through those processes. There's no shame in reaching out. Uh, there's no shame in getting that help. Or if you're engaged, I know there's some who are engaged seeking that premarital counseling to talk about the things, uh, what to expect when you walk into that marriage. Uh, again, thank you guys so much. Thank you for those of you who are online and watching this back later. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please let us know and please make sure to thank Glenn on your way out. Thank you.